All right. So mostly when I talk to people about scurvy, uh, everyone thinks it's like a joke disease that only pirates got, and all it does is like you know make your gums bleed and your teeth fall out. Anybody? Anybody in that crowd? All right, I, I see like one hand, and I have medical illustrations for you. This is gonna be awesome. Science. All right, so in 1753, James Lynn discovered that fresh citrus cures scurvy, and nobody ever got scurvy again. The end. <laughs> this is a great talk. Thank you for having me. Uh, so that's how it should have gone, except that the cure for scurvy was basically forgotten for about a 50-year period. Uh, so what happened was, uh, starting in 1799, the British Navy required its sailors to drink rations of lemon juice. Uh, <laughs> very wise. Um, and scurvy uh, dropped from something that could kill up to 90% of any given crew to sort of like a minor nuisance. Um, but in 1860, the British stopped buying lemons from Sicily. Side note, uh, the lemon industry in Sicily is how the mafia got their start, uh, because they owned the water rights to the lemon groves. Fun fact, different talk. <laughs> so they switched from buying Sicilian lemons to buying limes from the British colony of Jamaica, um, and limes uh, only have a quarter of the vitamin C of lemons. And also, the way the juice was being bottled and stored and processed uh, was destroying all of the remaining vitamin C. So, but the thing is that nobody noticed this for a while because by 1860, steam power had sh shortened most sea voyages, and scurvy takes a while to show up. So everyone was like, no, it's fine. <laughs> and then, uh, in 1875, an Arctic expedition uh, had to overwinter in the ice, and everyone got scurvy despite having drunk their lime juice rations. And everyone just kind of lost faith in the idea that lime juice could cure scurvy. And so the cure was effectively forgotten for about 50 years. So for the record, uh, vitamin C can be found in fresh fruits and vegetables and in fresh meat. So if you have access to those, you're going to be fine. Um, but if you're on a polar expedition and you're uh, eating dry rations and tinned food for years at a time, you are in trouble. Uh, on one of Scott's South Pole expeditions, Ernest Shackleton got so sick with scurvy that he started coughing up blood. So, in 1907, there was the first sort of glimmer of a cure because some research with guinea pigs proved that fresh food could cure scurvy, and yes, that means they gave scurvy to guinea pigs. <laughs> Poor little guys. Uh, but nobody knew what this mysterious antiscorbutic substance was. Uh, vitamin C itself wasn't isolated until 1932, uh, and it's called ascorbic acid because in Latin, A means no and scorb means scurvy, so ascorbic acid is no scurvy. <laughs> so the vitamin C molecule itself was isolated by Albert Schent Georgi, and he is the first this evening of our Nazi-hating badasses. So he offered all of his 1937 Nobel Prize money to the resistance in Finland, and then he joined, he joined the Hungarian resistance himself and got all of his Jewish friends out of the country. Uh, he was actually such a notorious Allied spy that Hitler himself issued his arrest warrant. Uh, but he escaped from house arrest and lived as a fugitive and ultimately survived the war. <laughs> so. By the time of World War II, people knew uh, that scurvy could be cured by vitamin C, and they knew how to make a vitamin C, but they didn't know how much of it you needed in your diet to keep you healthy, and this was a problem because there was really strict rationing uh, un under uh, wartime. So in order to determine the recommended daily allowance for vitamin C, England turned to the Sorby Research Institute and the Sheffield Volunteers. So in Sheffield, England, in 1940, a group of conscientious objectors volunteered to undergo medical research, either in lieu of serving uh, in the military, or to prove that despite being pacifists, they weren't cowards and they weren't afraid of hardship. There were 32 men and three women, and some of them, uh, such as Norman Proctor, who's pictured here, had been fired from their jobs because the other workers refused to work alongside a conscientious objector, because as you can imagine, pacifists in World War II were not super popular. Um, the founder of the institute was an entomologist who wanted to fight in the war but wasn't allowed, and so he came up with a study about the transmission and cure of scabies. Yeah. 
So scabies is horrible, just in case you're wondering. It's nightmare itch insects that burrow under your skin. Um, and it was keeping a lot of soldiers in the hospital for a long period of time. So the first experiment the volunteers signed up for was contracting scabies. It was not the last thing they signed up for. They also had to contract malaria. Uh, and there was one experiment that required them to survive on shipwreck rations and no water for three and a half days. So the vitamin C test uh, was headed up by Hans Adolf Krebs, who was a brilliant uh, German biochemist who had been summarily fired from his job in 1933 and forced to flee the country because, of course, he was Jewish. So Krebs's study involved depriving the volunteers of vitamin C for up to two years, and everyone but the controls came down with scurvy. So let's talk about what scurvy does to you. Uh, basically, it breaks down your connective tissues and your blood vessels, and you kind of need those, so it's not pretty. Um, and I'm going to be honest, these next couple of slides are pretty rough. Uh, so I've added some pictures of kittens, <laughs> so you have something else to look at. So you start out with the plugged hair follicles, uh, and when those start to bleed internally, you end up with red lumps all over your skin. And then the gums start to swell and bleed, and I'm going to be honest, that's a Google image search I never want to do again. So we're just going to talk about ecchymosis. And uh, ecchymosis is basically bruises that occur without trauma, so it's a different kind of internal bleeding. Uh, and, and then things get worse. <laughs> so old scars can reopen as fresh wounds and new wounds refuse to heal, and we know this because the volunteers in the study allowed the researchers to slice open their legs <laughs> to find this out. So toward the end of the study, two of the volunteers had heart attacks because their heart muscles basically started to disintegrate. Um, they were immediately dosed with vitamin C, and they recovered, and the researchers said, okay, so study over. <laughs> We're done, and the COs refused to quit because this was the service that they had signed up for to serve humanity, and they were not going to stop until it was done. Yeah, science. So fortunately, uh, none of the COs or the volunteers suffered permanent damage. Uh, they did take months and months to recover. Uh, but Norman Proctor's only uh, lifelong evidence of his service were the scars that he had from the rest of his life from the wound studies. So current ethics standards mean that nobody uh, can do these kind of medical tests again on this kind of scale, you know, not legally. Um, Ethel Stewart was one of the last surviving volunteers in 2003, and she and all of the other volunteers that were surveyed agreed that their service had absolutely been worthwhile and that they would volunteer to do it again. So the next time you take your daily RDA of vitamin C, and it's 60 milligrams if you're wondering, uh, think of the pacifists who help figure out that dose. And just remember, when life gives you scurvy, make lemonade. Oh, yeah, yeah.